on the elections issue. So that'll be in the, around seven o'clock. Okay, so hope you'll stay for that. But I, I got to know Sheriff Mack back in 2012 when I was running for Dallas County Sheriff. I went to several of the events which were in Las Vegas. And I remember the, one of the first years I got to meet Sheriff Joe Arpaio, Sheriff Joe, and he was honored as our Sheriff of the Year at the time. So really uh, many great memories. Uh, 2013, we had the event. How many of you were at the event at the Ameristar uh, Resort there on the Missouri River near St. Louis in 2013? A few of you? Great, really great memories. Sure, we honored Sheriff Clark that year. We had a tornado come near the building. We haven't had to take cover from anything yet. And what a difference a week makes, right? With all the winter weather we've had. Well, let me go ahead and introduce this gentleman who really needs no introduction. You all know the founder of our organization, but when I read these bios, I sometimes learn things I didn't know before, so it's, it's really fun for me. I'll just give you the abbreviated version. Richard Mack is the founder of the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, and he began his career with the Provo Police Department as a parking enforcement cadet while attending BYU. A couple of years later, he became a full-time officer and was soon promoted to corporal and then sergeant and detective. His most dramatic experience there was a one-year assignment as an undercover narcotics agent. And I think you grew a beard, didn't you? And yeah, he didn't look like he looks now. And after nearly 11 years at Provo PD, he decided to return to his childhood turf in Arizona and he ran for Graham County Sheriff. And he'll tell you more of his story, I know. But Sheriff uh, Mack is uh, his campaign took off at that time, and he was elected in 1988, was it? 1988. So here we are in 2020, and if you will, rise to your feet and give, help give me a warm CSPO welcome to our founder, Sheriff Richard Mack. Thank you. You can cover my face, just don't cover my hair. All right, thank you. All right. <laughs> you know, this is a, a thrill for me uh, to look at so many people here, especially with the uh, Texas hats on. Um, an army of wonderful people here to set other people free. And uh, that's what we're about. And I want to make this very clear right at the beginning. We have never, and we will never, advocate violence of any kind, okay? We believe in standing strong, but uh, this is a peaceful and effective process, a la Martin Luther King, a la Gandhi, a la Rosa Parks, and many of the other heroes throughout history who were willing to stand and fight for liberty um, without the violence. When you say fight, that kind of denotes violence, but no, it is a fight. There's no question about that. Um, both sides of the aisle say fight all the time. Uh, it does not mean we're trying to hit somebody. I will tell you this too. Uh, Kurt just did a wonderful job introducing me, and I spent 20 years in law enforcement. During that time, I never once committed an act of violence towards another human being. Never. I broke up fights. I, I tackled a shoplifter once. Uh, it was a foggy day and uh, he didn't see me coming and, and I tackled him. And, but after that, uh, that was it. That's where it ended. Okay? It reminded me of my old football days. And I, I, I remi got reminded a, a little bit after that of a fight downtown on, on Center Street, right downtown. And uh, two guys were fighting. And I gave them uh, the kind of the linebacker forearm shiver. Both of them went down, and that was the end of it. I said, you can go to jail, or you can go that way, or you can go that way. But that was the extent of it. And I never shot anybody. I would have if I had to. Well, there was a situation that if I told all of you, you would say, you should have shot that guy. And, and uh, he was waving a gun at us, but we had good cover. And I'm telling you, I 
just could not pull the trigger. I had started because his 10-year-old son was standing next to him. And so we waited it out. Finally, we talked him into putting the gun down, and uh, that was the extent of it. And uh, so I told him, uh, this might be a surprise to you. I took his guns away from him, and I told him as soon as he told, uh, came and showed me proof that he had gone to rehab for meth, that I would give him back his guns. So uh, I was doing it for him, I was doing it for his son, I was doing it for our community, and he came in and argued with me uh, about getting his guns back, and I said, not until you show me that, that you've been to rehab. I said, you scared your son to death, and I said, I, I'm not gonna give them back to you. I said, you can go buy another one, I can't stop you from doing that, but if I find out, uh, I'll try to take that one too. Uh, so uh, we're trying to be honest and fair with the people that we're dealing with, and I was. Uh, also, the backdrop of this entire conference is simply, what is government's role? And when government goes too far, and is there anybody that's intelligent enough and sensitive enough in our government, state, local, federal, to realize when we've gone too far? We've gone too far. It's, this is ridiculous that we're coming to the American people now. And I think General Washington lamented this fact, that our government now says, we can do anything to you that we want, as long as we can say there's an emergency. We can destroy freedom of religion. We can destroy the right to peaceably assemble. Even freedom of the press and freedom of speech have been so bastardized. And the First Amendment is hardly even recognizable. Any of you ever try to petition the government for a redress of grievances? You write the letters all the time, don't you? Do you ever get any response? No. And so the whole thing is that we've got to get back to what General Washington said, the principles upon which our country was made. Because we profess and we advocate that there is no exception to liberty. And my health choices are just that. They're mine. They do not belong to government. As Jefferson warned us, he said, in a republic such as ours, we can persuade the people and we can reason with the people, but we cannot force the people. So that we're actually putting people in jail for not wearing a mask? Have we gone totally insane? That we're, we've actually done this. And it was reported by the press almost proudly when a sheriff in Florida arrested Pastor Rodney Howard Brown just for having church. And a group of parishioners in Mississippi who were staying in their cars, listening to the pastor on the radio, the pastor and the parishioners were all cited in. That's why we're having this convention, because we'll have sheriffs who will interpose, stand in the way, and make sure that we're not victimizing our citizens all in the name of it's for your own good. It's for your own good? I'll tell you what's for my own good, that I'm able to have freedom to raise my family as I and God choose, not government. So, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we wanted to make sure, Tanya, what was it? Where's Tanya? What did you remind me to say? Oh, yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, oh, and you guys, uh, Tanya, bring, bring my wife in here for just a second. Everybody thinks Tanya's my wife, okay? Tanya has been my executive assistant, volunteer basis, 
since we started the CSPOA in Fredericksburg, Texas. Did she leave? You're a magician? Oh yeah. I would call her the miracle worker. She's worked miracles. Okay, so the, the pretty little blonde girl, the one that doesn't want to come up here, that's my wife, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, and then Tanya is my executive assistant. So all my life just about, and my wife and I will be married 46 years in May. So just a couple months away, and thank you. And you know how you stay married to the same person for 46 years? Yes, dear, yes, dear, yes, dear, yeah, I'll, yes. And, and quite honestly, um, I need to tell you a little story about her. Um, I'm not gonna tell you how we met, but that was a miracle too. But the, the reason I'm standing before you today is because in, as Kurt mentioned, in 1988, I did something really, really crazy. Because in 1983, when I was a rookie cop, well, I'd been on about three and a half years, I had an epiphany that affected me so much that I decided to start studying the Constitution. And I kept a World Book Encyclopedia of the U.S. Constitution in my patrol vehicle for weeks at a time. And I was studying the Constitution. And you know, the Bill of Rights really hit me. And you know, of the Bill of Rights, uh, I found out that it was similar to the Magna Carta of the year 1215. That, and this, was, this wasn't new. And the, the Declaration of Rights in England of the rights of free men in about 1650 was the same thing. It listed a declaration of rights that is for government to never violate. And so the founders did the Constitution without a Bill of Rights. And then a few of the more radical, you know, the radical ones that really believe in liberty and all that stuff. So uh, John Hancock, Samuel Adams, and Patrick Henry came back to Madison and said, we made a mistake. And Madison, you know how he felt about the Constitution. He loved it. And he was considered the father of the Constitution. So he took offense and he didn't want anything to do with it. He goes, you guys, that Constitution's perfect. We were praying, you know we were inspired. Then how did we forget that one little part called a Declaration of Rights? And Madison goes, you're absolutely correct. Let's go back to the drawing board. And they added the Bill of Rights. Do you know how many originally they came up with? 189. Wouldn't we do about the same today if we were allowed to do the Bill of Rights? And so they dwindled them down to 12. And you know what happened after that? The states the real power in our country, the states ratified 10. And you know, right towards the end of the Declaration of Independence, you know what it says about the states? These colonies are and uh, uh, of right to be free and independent states. And of course they formed a union, but it was, it was, very, very limited in its scope and authority. And as a matter of fact, for you law enforcement officers, well, for everybody, in fact, to answer Tanya's question, why would you join CSPOA? Why? Especially citizens, why would you join? Because your employee, the sheriff who works only for you and answers only to you, he answers to no other bureaucrat. The county manager is not the boss of your sheriff. The county commissioners are not the boss of your sheriff. The governor, the president, Congress, the state legislature, none of those groups are the boss of your sheriff. The reason that Franklin said a republic instead of a democracy is because ours is a republic surrounded and modified and ruled by a rule book called the Constitution. So yes, you swore an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution because you were required to by the supreme law of the land in order to take your job. And so the Bill of Rights was established by the states or the people or the founders. And your sheriff 
only answers to you. And every four you, years, you review his or her job, and you say whether or not that person stays. That is the difference between a republic and a democracy. We the people choose, not the mob. Not the majority rules, but the Constitution rules. And our job as public officials is to make sure the Constitution stays intact. I have maintained, ever since I sued the Clinton administration back in 1994 and even before that, that we're not in trouble in this country because we follow the Constitution too strictly. And I say, for one year, I challenge everybody in government, all throughout our country, from the dog catcher all the way down to the president. Yeah, there's some order in there somewhere. Uh, that every single person follow the Constitution, obey the Constitution. As a matter of fact, do you want unity, President Biden? Do we want civility? I pray for it. But it has to start with some fundamental principles that we all agree on. And that would have to be the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, to the Bill of Rights. There's about 28 principles of liberty that are expressed in the Bill of Rights. Do you really want an Asian American simply for possessing a gun to go to jail? Has never committed a crime with it? Do you really want a black American who owns a gun? I don't care what kind of gun it is. It could be that assault rifle that General Washington was talking about. I don't care. In a free country, we choose. It's my choice to have one or not, or what kind I have. We want black Americans, Mexican Americans, Asian Americans, all of us, doesn't matter, I don't care what race or what color or what religion you are. Should any of us in this country where we have a guaranteed right to keep and bear arms, and let's make no mistake, the Second Amendment nor your state constitution gave me that right. I was born with that right. The Constitution merely protects it. Do you know, I don't believe it's ever going to happen, because they certainly would have done it by now, that they would abolish the Second Amendment. But pragmatically, that's exactly what they're doing, isn't it? And they're proud of that, and they brag about it. But the thing of it is, it doesn't matter if they can show some statistical analysis about the Second Amendment, whether it gun control works or it reduces crime or it doesn't work crime or, or my right to keep and bear makes everybody safer in the community and my family. That really, we're not talking about the efficacy of owning a gun. We're talking about what does the law say? And in the United States of America, my dear friends, and I've got a book out there that is about that, The Magic of Gun Control. Gun control in the United States of America is against the law. And it, that's really obvious. So how could we as sheriffs violate our oath and violate the, the constitution of the state and man, there's some state constitution that are really butt kickers when it comes to the right to keep and bear arms, much more so than the Second Amendment is in the Constitution. And some of the original 13 colonies, go look at what their constitutions say about the right to keep and bear arms. Whoa, it's, it's amazing. Nevada, look at Nevada's constitution about the right to keep and bear arms. It's amazing. Look at Missouri, and we're gonna probably bring this up later, especially tomorrow. But Newton County, Missouri, just passed an ordinance that the Second Amendment would have to be obeyed by federal agents, or federal agents are subject to arrest, okay? Is that peaceful? That's a peaceful process. Totally support Newton County. I talked to their sheriff, tried to get him here. He wasn't able to be here, but they sent me a copy of the ordinance. Amazing. Why do we even have to do that? It's, it's astonishing that we do, and I know a lot of places in Texas that have. And one other housekeeping thing here, uh, you'll notice that this book, and it's kind of a funny title and a funny front page, isn't it? You see, that actually has Sheriff Pam Elliott on the front cover from Edwards County, Texas. 
And uh, we were sorry she just lost her reelection bid just barely, but uh, we're grateful that she now is working for Sheriff Capers and she's a detective. And let me tell you, she's kind of a petite little lady. I wouldn't mess with her if I were any of you. And so I was gonna be on the cover of my own book. It's my book, I can be on the cover if I want, okay? But I fired me and I hired Pam Elliott. And I think that that's a real cover. You know, Goliath is coming up behind her and she's just standing there. I got this. And I love it, I love it, her confidence. And we'll hear from her a little bit later in, the, in our conference because man, she's got a tremendous story to tell. But this is, this is really the first public convention where she and I had the book together. So if you want both of us to sign it, I probably didn't bring enough, but we'll, we'll be happy to autograph graph them for you if, if uh, you wanna get a copy. And uh, it's, it's a hellacious book. Uh, but we're gonna get going on the training. We've gotta get the training done. And somebody, Rick or uh, Kelly or somebody make sure I don't go over. And I'm not sure when that is, but make sure. I, I think for about the next hour, I'm gonna be giving you the CSPOA training. And so citizens, why do you wanna be invo involved? Because your employee is. And you need to be working with your sheriff and with everybody. This country does not stay together without we the people involved. An ignorant population doesn't work. In fact, Jefferson warned us about that that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Who's supposed to be vigilant? We, the people. We are the biggest and most important part of our constitution. And we need to make sure that our employee, the sheriff or anybody else, the governor, your state reps, city councils, are doing their job. And what is their job? I quote, from the Declaration of Independence, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. That is their job. And do you think that keeping your oath would be part of your job? Can you imagine somebody in public service taking an oath and wittingly not keeping it? Sheriffs, could you tell me what charge that is criminally? That's perjury. Try to do that in a courtroom where you swear uh, to tell the truth and then you, oh, but only as long as the Supreme Court allows me to, or only as long as my supervisor allows me to, you are responsible for the fulfillment of your oath, no one else. You cannot abdicate the fulfillment of your oath to someone else, which presupposes that you know and understand the Constitution. So it might be even there that you actually read it and to help what Sheriff uh, Evanson was just saying a little while ago about protecting our borders, Article 4, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government and shall protect each, shall protect each of them from invasion. Doesn't mean they have to be carrying guns and trying to, oh, but many of them do. We must protect our borders. And if the federal government doesn't do it, can we do it ourselves? Absolutely. And what comes first in America? Liberty. Liberty comes first. When JFK sent troops into Alabama back in the 60s to get rid of segregation, was he correct? Absolutely. Because all of us want one thing, Liberty and the notion that all men are created equal is all about liberty. And you know that what we did in this country? Were we a bunch of puppets? The Supreme Court ruled in Plessy versus Ferguson that segregation was okay. And you know what they called it? The US Supreme Court. Sometimes we need to go against them. You know that? You know, this is what they did. They actually ruled. In a segregation case in Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal doctrine. You're all equal, but you dark-complected equals are over there and you light-complected equals are over here. 
And that's exactly what they said. And for 55 years, we were stupid enough to enforce that. And then along came Rosa Parks in 1955. And I'll get into that in just a little bit. All I want you now to know is the video you're going to see next of Sheriff, uh, Deputy, Deputy Sheriff Stan Lenick is all we're after. So, oh, I got it. Wait, where do I got it? Oh, <laughs> you mean it's right in front of me? Why would I expect that? Okay. The YouTube video going viral, posted on the internet by two activists who brought a camera into the Albany International Airport while they passed out flyers. Now it led to a heated dispute over First Amendment rights. Beth Wortman has our top story. Beth. Hi, Benita. Well, as you'll see in the video clip, an airport spokesman tries to stop these activists from their mission. But a sheriff's deputy steps in to settle the confrontation and the right to free speech. So, hey everyone, this is Ashley Jessica. I am here at Albany International Airport. The young woman is standing outside the security checkpoint at the airport, telling the camera that she's there to hand out flyers to travelers, reminding them of their right to opt out of getting the body scan, which she claims carries health risks. Okay, yeah, this is, hold on, hold on. First of all, turn this off right away. Airport spokesman Doug Myers tells the crew to stop videotaping and to go downstairs, which they agree to do, and they are confronted again. Sir, sir. You have a million dollars insurance policy here. You're violating the airport authority guidelines. That doesn't matter to us at all. Okay, you so can check that out. No, you're in our airport. But as the tension builds, Sheriff's Deputy Stan Lennox steps in, separating the two parties, then lays down it's the your, law. Obviously, this is your constitutional right. Okay. As far as we're concerned, you're not breaking any laws. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who does he think he is? He's a deputy, and he's going to come in here and tell people what their constitutional rights are? He's not a judge. He's not a lawyer, thank God. He's a public servant that took an oath. We just want you to know this is your constitutional right. You're not breaking any laws. You see, folks, the enforcement of principles, the enforcement of our Constitution is the best de-escalation training you can ever have. Here was a deputy who probably called a supervisor before he did all this. You think he did? I think he did. But regardless, I actually hope that he did because it shows that more people know about it than just him. In 2013, we honored this deputy as the deputy sheriff of the year. Probably should have said decade. Deputy Stan Lenick from Albany, New York. Protecting the rights of the people doing exactly what we train people to do here. Was there any violence? No. He stepped in, prevented anybody from getting beat up and thrown out and thrown down and nightsticked and said, he told you to leave, now you're leaving. He told you to wear a mask, now get it on. Oh wait, sorry. I digress. That's, that's what we want to get across to you guys. Okay. Myers objects, ordering airport employees to allow only ticketed passengers upstairs, accusing the activists of blocking the escalator. But once again, Deputy Lennox defends their First Amendment rights. Okay, so that we means we're doing it are. for... I yeah. told you why I am. Okay. I am Jason no. Burmes. Let me see your you identification. I don't need to show you my identification. He doesn't, he doesn't have to show you his identification. Okay. The <laughs> activists continue their... I love this guy. Yeah, you, you, folks... Did we miss this on the news? You know why we missed this on the national news? This made some news, obviously. But we had to really find this, and we're glad we did. But how much would we have heard of this if Deputy Len it went out of line like a lot of cops do to nowadays? And that this became something that we heard about because the deputy didn't respect rights at this time. Enforce the Constitution, my dear friends. Let me say it again. You want de-escalation training for your office? The oath of office in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights is the best way to get it. And we've maintained that at CSPOA for a long time. Now, this is what we're after, and this is just the opposite. Now to a News 10 exclusive. A Stockton man wants an apology tonight 
for a wake-up call he should have never received. It is a story you'll only see on News 10. Lee Painter tells us why police and federal agents knocked down his door. This is what they did to my door. At 6 this morning, a SWAT team surprised Kenneth Wright at his front door. In my underwear. In my underwear. Before I get to the door, I hear him. So sheriffs and other law enforcement, looks like a no-knock warrant, doesn't it? Use the battering ram to get through his door. Say, hit it. And I get ready to hit the door, and they hit the door. It almost hit me. So I said, hold on. They hit it again. I said, hold on. But the SWAT team busted in, taking right. They come grab me by my neck and drag me out my house to right there in the grass. Thrown to the ground and handcuffed, law enforcement then searched his house. And they put me in the backseat of a police car for over six hours. From six o'clock to 1230, they had me handcuffed in the back of a police car with nothing on but my ripped up underwear that they ripped in the yard. Wright says they also woke his three children, holding them for two hours. But they failed to find their quarry, Wright's estranged wife. Wright later complained to Stockton's mayor and police, but the city pointed to the U.S. Department of Education. They say you owe a... The Department of Education SWAT team. And they asked Stockton PD to go with them, and they did absolutely. Now, we thought, well, maybe this is just an anomaly. You know, this just happened. You guys, this was seven or eight years ago. Obama administration. Nobody complained about this. Nobody did a story about this. Why are you doing this? That means the Department of Education and Department of J J Justice, DOJ, is involved in this. And so we thought, well, we're going to do our own investigation, which I did. Found out it happened also to another black man in Houston, and that Houston had hundreds of these warrants to serve. You guys, you know what this was for? His wife, who didn't even live there, they were estranged, failed to pay her student loan. Obama administration and Biden were serving warrants on people with SWAT teams. Now, if somebody owes you money in a civil matter, wouldn't you want to go use a SWAT team to get your money? It's exactly what the federal government did. Got a free ride on this, didn't they? And all this guy wanted was an apology? I haven't tried to contact him, but boy, I'm not a lawyer, but I think he would have a pretty good lawsuit on this one, especially how they treated his children. And out, out in the car in his underwear for six hours, handcuffed, and the whole thing was about his wife. So the, the uh, what is it, the general, not, solicitor general, came out and said, no, we don't serve these on people who haven't paid their student loan. We found out that was a lie and that they were. And that Houston had the most of them, but they were all over the country. SWAT teams, I think even, even us poor ignorant law enforcement officers know that that's a civil matter, correct? And they, yeah, crazy. And people call me crazy. Huh. This is what we are against. And that Stockton PD went along with this, that's what we gotta be careful. When the federal government agents come and ask us to go do stuff with them, we better make sure we do our homework for them, okay? Now, I love this quote, and a lot of people give me credit for it, but it wasn't me. Anybody can tell me who it was? Unless I already told you before, don't answer. So, we're supposed to all obey just laws, conversely. One has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. Well, this brings up a good question right now, doesn't it? Who's supposed to decide what is unjust? Well, first of all, we the people do. We're in charge, okay? Secondly, your employees in government are supposed to make that determination. So you call your sheriff and complain, hey, I'm kind of getting treated unjustly here. Sheriff, most of the time with a simple phone call, you can get that taken care of. And I'm not kidding you, I did it lots of times. And then you might even have to do something that Sheriff Rogers is gonna talk about a little bit later. And I did it, not with my lawsuit, but I had problems with the EPA and Army Corps of Engineers coming into my county threatening to arrest 
uh, our employees and threatening to arrest the county commissioners because we were going to fix a bridge without their permission. We already knew the bridge had to be fixed, and they threatened to arrest everybody that was going to touch it, including the county commissioners, and charge us $35,000 a day for every day we're in violation. So I told them we're going to fix that bridge, and if they got in their way, I was going to arrest them. Well, so they left town, and we fixed the bridge. We took care of the people in our county because the federal government just kept getting in the way. So we got them out of the way, and we'd never paid a, a dime in fines. Nobody went to jail. Everything ended peacefully, okay? And the people were served that the federal government had been working on for 10 months because they were trying to do an environmental impact study. Oh my gosh. So we took care of it. And one thing was really cool. About two and a half years ago, my son was working out at a nurse in Arizona in a cardiac unit. And uh, he started talking to the man that was in there visiting his wife. And he asked my son where he's from. And he said, Thatcher, Arizona, just a couple hours from here. And he goes, really? Well, that's kind of funny because a few years back, the sheriff in that community kicked me out. And he goes, that was my dad. <laughs> he, he's kind of crazy, you know. But you know, folks, if it all ends peacefully and we take care of the people, isn't that what we're after? That's what we're after. And, and I've never said don't work with the federal government. But you got to make sure that you are a wonderful and positive checks and balance for that. Now, does anybody know who said this quote? That would be Martin Luther King. And not only is Martin Luther King absolutely correct about this, but do you think any of us in law enforcement have any responsibility whatsoever to enforce unjust, tyrannical laws? In fact, they're not laws at all. In fact, Michael Peruca is going to really start getting after me because I'm calling them laws. They're not law. Okay? Governor mandates are not laws. Okay? And even if a legislature passed it, that you should give your seat to a white man, would we be enforcing that? Of course not. Because we're smarter than that, and we know the Constitution, and we know these principles, and we don't enforce tyranny. We're not here to support tyrants. We swore an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, in other words, our God-given rights. And how is that subversive? That we're putting freedom and liberty first in the execution of the law and our jobs. That protects everybody. And if we have to retrain some other state agents or people from the health department or set them straight, and by all means, set them straight. That is our job. And I'm going to prove this to you as we go along here. And most of this is going to be coming from a book that everybody should have, dozens of these in your office and around, so that you're able to show people the only time in U.S. history where a couple of sheriffs sued the federal government, took it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and won. You're looking at the person who started that entire movement. And I'm so proud of this. Because quite frankly, as I was telling you earlier, the story about that is, my wife made the decision. Yes, I received a very strong feeling that I was supposed to sue the government to get out from underneath this. And then I go, huh, there's no way my wife's going to let me do this. She's no way. Well, I don't know what went wrong that day. She must have been having a bad hair day or something. Because I came in from a Phoenix meeting with all the sheriffs of the state where three agents of the BATF showed up and said, Sheriff, here's your document, 25-page document from the Justice Department stating as to why the sheriffs of this country had to work for the federal government for free and without contract and without negotiation under a threat of arrest if we failed to comply. I'm not kidding. And they call me crazy? The federal government is literally threatening to arrest every sheriff of this country if we don't comply with their idiotic Brady Bill enforcement. Do you know how many sheriffs fought it? Seven. 
seven. And yes, I started the whole thing. Then Sheriff Prince from Montana joined the lawsuit. And he and I ended up at the Supreme Court. And we're going to go uh, over uh, some of this stuff so you know what we're talking about. And so you can hand this to somebody else and said, look what the Supreme Court said about overreach. This is about overreach. And you need to show this to your governors and your state legislators, your city councils, county commissioners, other sheriffs, other peace officers, because we don't have to go along with them. Anybody here work for the federal government? Can they tell you what to do? Do they pay your salary? Can they fire you? Do they hire you? By, for, and of the people, that's where you work, all right? Now, this is your oath of office. The wording is a little bit different in, in some of them, but this is mostly it. A lot of them say protect from both enemies, foreign and domestic. This one in particular didn't. I can't remember what state I got this from. I think it was Utah, actually. Maybe, maybe Arizona, because that's when I put this together. I was in Arizona. I'm from Arizona. Wikipedia says I was born in Arizona. Lie. I was born in St. Louis. Uh, but it's really funny that people that are your enemies can put stuff on Wikipedia about you, you know? So they never get it right. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep going. We're gonna, we've are going. got to get through some of this. Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution requires you by the Founding Fathers, all three branches, senators and representatives, so that's a legislative department, and the members of the several state legislatures, so both the states and of the United States, executive and judicial, so all three branches of government and every officer therein is required by the supreme law of the land. If you do not keep your oath, you are violating the supreme law of the land. I think you should be prosecuted. I think you should be doing investigations on people who don't keep their oath. Okay? But. Shall, not maybe, not optional, shall be bound by sacred oath. That's all the founding fathers believed they needed from you, is that you would keep your word. Do you know what it meant for them to violate their word? Ooh, we need to get back to some of those fundamental values, don't we? Okay. What is the purpose of all government? Who can quote that for me real quick from the audience? I just said it a while ago. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. It's in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. There it is. You should have that memorized. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and institute new government. We should be altering that. That's what our job is. You guys, I didn't make this stuff up, but I sure love it. This is powerful stuff, okay? And then they go again about long train of abuses and tyranny and blah, 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 and how it's the right of the people to change it. State nullification, did I make that up? Nope, but Jefferson and Madison did and they really knew what they were talking about. States have the authority to judge the constitutionality of the federal government's laws and decrees. I didn't make that up. Do you know that the, the, the Supreme Court, in Article 3 of the Constitution, where it talks about judicial branch, the word interpret is not there? Are they supposed to interpret all the laws and say if they're constitutional? Do you know what they're supposed to do? They, just like us, took the same oath to the Constitution. They're supposed to enforce the Constitution, and the decisions they make are supposed to be in line with the Constitution. When I won my case at the U.S. Supreme Court, it was a 5-4 split. Do you know why? Because there were five Republicans and four Democrats. And the four Democrats sided with Clinton. And the five Republicans sided with me. Now, folks, we are not partisan here. Don't you wish the Supreme Court was not? Don't you wish it would follow the law? So, you guys, I didn't ask everybody, but I asked a, a few when they came in if they were Democrat or Republicans, because we wanted to make sure we had some Democrats here in the room, and we do. And we hope that we have that unity and that we can create that civil civility. And again, how do we do that? We have to have some principles that we all agree on. Shouldn't that be the Bill of Rights? Shouldn't we start there? We can. Okay. 
All right. He also argued that the state should refuse to enforce laws which they deemed unconstitutional. Doesn't that sound like a great check and balance? Do you know that that's what the whole uh, system of the Constitution is? It's all about checks and balances. Now, I'm going to show you more where you're going to see where this is really powerful. This decision was written by Justice Scalia, Antonin Scalia. And man, is it powerful. Do you know what he does in here? He takes us through a history lesson. He quotes the Bill of Rights. We filed on the 10th Amendment on this. The 10th Amendment, state sovereignty, state independence. Don't we feel that and uphold that in Texas? This is a great place to restart our country as a constitutional republic that it was meant to be. And all we have to do sometimes is tell government bureaucrats that that's what we will do here and that they better not get in the way. Okay, good. We just helped the people, didn't we? And Michael Peruca is gonna go over this a little bit more, but I just want you to know and understand the word interpose. Look at that. The state's legislature is duty bound to interpose its power to prevent the federal government from victimizing its people. That's, that's in the uh, Kentucky, Kentucky resolution written by Jefferson. Okay. All right, here's the two guys, that, the two sheriffs that did the case. Jay Prince from Montana, yours truly from Arizona. And look at this. First thing off, the U.S. Supreme Court says, we have held, however, that state legislatures are not subject to federal direction. Does that mean sheriffs are, though? The counties are subject to federal direction, but the state isn't? No. We're, it's the state or any of its political subdivisions are not subject to federal direction. And let's never forget this. Even this case calls the sheriffs the Clio. If you want to see it somewhere in writing, just check with the Brady Bill, because it was served on all the sheriffs of this country back in 1994. That happened on January 21st, 1994, where they came to the sheriff's meeting in Phoenix. We only have 15 counties in Arizona. You have 254. Fine with me. Everything's bigger in Texas. I get it, okay? 13 of us were there. But when we got this, I started reading it, and it called the sheriffs that they served this on the Cleos. Wonderful. The chief law enforcement officer. So if, if anybody ever wants to see it in writing, it's in the Brady Bill, and it's in this decision. Mac is thus forced to choose between keeping his oath or obeying the act. This is from, the, this is from Judge Roll in the district court. He's actually bringing up the oath of office. I didn't do that. He did. Subjected himself to possible sanctions. He was livid that they were threatening to arrest us. And you know, my, my attorney, I actually, the NRA helped with this case, and I had my own attorney working with the NRA on this case. And my attorney came to me. His name was Dave Hardy. He said, do you want to have some more fun? <laughs> yeah, that's all I need. More, more fun with the federal government. And he said, I think we could get injunction from the Clinton administration from trying to arrest you as long as we're in court for failure to comply. And I said, great. Guess what, folks? We got it. Janet Reno said that that provision in the law wasn't aimed at the sheriffs. And the federal district judge, John Roll, said, uh, Ms. Reno, you don't get to violate uh, and interpret the law for the federal government. That's what it says, Matt gets his injunction. Do you realize I got an order of protection from the Clinton administration? You know, I know, crazy. And that's all part of the record, we got it. So I always look at that and I go, look at all the ladies that sued Bill Clinton over the years. I mean, even way back when he was governor, I was the only one to sue Bill Clinton on a non-sexual matter. <laughs> I know. Isn't that wonderful? I know. Anyway, okay, so there it is. It calls us the Cleo. And that was, that was the sheriffs. And now look at, here's the threat of arrest, just to make sure you know I'm not making this stuff up, right out of the Brady Bill, under a separate provision of the 
Gun Control Act. That's the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968. Any person who knowingly violates the section of the GCA amended by the Brady Bill shall be fined under this title, imprisoned for no more than one year or both. Now you know why I was glad to get that injunction. I was looking at a fine, $10,000 or so, and a, a year in prison just for telling them no. I highly recommend that you tell them that a lot. Tell them no. That usually ends it right there. All right. All right. Then it, that's just saying why we objected to the Brady Bill. And uh, Ronald Reagan has sailed the tax. Now, why do I bring up the tax system? Because we get a lot of abusive agents in our counties who are there to enforce uh, crazy, cruel, bullying tactics uh, in our counties. Now, I bring this up because if this is about taxes. And now, this is Thomas Paine. Britain with an army to enforce her tyranny. My dear friends, we can never be part of that. We are not the army to enforce tyranny. We are the army to enforce the supreme law of the land. We are the guards of the republic and the protectors of the constitution. That is our job. Preserving liberty, that's the main job for any law enforcement officer anywhere in this country. Patrol officers, yes. Deputy Lenick, what a great example of a true patrol officer. Absolutely. Now, this has taken us full circle, and Payne proves it right here. Britain has declared that she has a right not only to tax us, according to the Stamp Act, but to bind us in all cases whatsoever. In other words, they can do anything they want. And they didn't even have coronavirus. They got to do anything they wanted to us, just like they're doing now. You know, if, if Fauci, who's never been elected to anything, if he came out and said, we have new science, that the coronavirus germs are lighter than oxygen and air, and they rise. So we are going, instead of masks, we're not gonna sell masks anymore. We're gonna sell knee pads and hand pads. So everywhere you go, you're crawling to stay below those horrible coronavirus germs and you can do it and we're doing it for each other and we're here to save each other and we're we're going to crawl every way as soon as you get out of your car get on the ground and crawl how many people would be crawling everywhere and buying those pads up in walgreens and and all over the country and and asking people are you sure these pads really work i want these great pads i want the ones with an exhaust and, and i want really good pads so none of my kids get hurt crawling in the Safeway parking lot. How many people would be doing it? Usually when I make crazy antidotes like that, I be careful because they might just happen, you know. You never know what you're going to get. So this law, this act, was called the Declaratory Act, and it was passed by... King George III and the English Parliament because they got sick and tired of us complaining about everything they were doing, especially the Stamp Act. And so Paine said this, if being bound in that manner is not slavery, then is there such a thing as slavery upon earth? Folks, if government can do anything to you that it wants, Something is drastically wrong. And I submit that it's happening right now. Now, on this tax issue, Jennifer Long, an IRS agent, testified before Congress in 1998 that Congress routinely broke the law, or that the IRS routinely broke the law, and that they did bullying and horrible ta uh, tactics which appear nowhere in their IRS manual, and as you say down at the bottom, sometimes illegal. I ask you, sheriffs, I'm serious about this. Is the federal government going to stop this? 
And are they going to protect the people of your state from the bullying tactics of the IRS? Are they? Have they ever? No matter who was president, did that ever change? Republican or Democrat, did that ever change? I will, I will admit, it appears that, that Trump did not use the IRS to go after his enemies. At least there's no proof of that, but he was too busy with so many other things that I don't think they ever even checked on that one. So I'm not positive he didn't, but there was no sign of that. But Obama did it, and Bush did it, and Clinton did it, and FDR made it a specialty to use the IRS and sometimes the FBI to go after their political enemies. Nixon really did it. In fact, Nixon had the FBI and the CIA going against each other on the same issue because he told them to. Astonishing. Oh, here we go. Front page of USA Today, March of 2015. U.S. drug agents engaged in sex parties. Cartels supplied the prostitutes, the Justice Review finds. And how long did it go? For years, drug enforcement agents in Colombia were having sex parties, and the cartels provided the bribes. This also had a hearing before a Congressional Judiciary Committee. Do you know how many of these agents were prosecuted? Do you know how many of them were fired? Do you know how many of them were disciplined? The first female director of the DEA resigned, and they changed the name on her door, and nothing else happened. And these are the federal agents that we're supposed to be allowing in our communities to go after our citizens with impunity. No, my dear friends. We might go golfing with some of these guys, and we might have coffee with them on Friday mornings. But we must be careful who we allow to deal with our citizens in our counties. Very careful. The federal government will never do anything to put these people in line. So who has the responsibility to do that? We must be very vigilant and careful who goes after our citizens. What signifies it to me, Payne said, in other words, what difference does it make to me whether he who destroys my property and kills or threatens to kill me is a king or a common man, my countryman or not my countryman, whether it be done by an individual villain or an army of them? If we reason to the root of things, we shall find no difference. Neither can, we just, neither can any just cause be assigned why we should punish in the one case and pardon in the other. That is the rule of thumb in Washington, D.C. We don't, we don't stop the IRS from committing its crimes. We don't uh, prosecute DEA agents or any others who commit crimes. We are not careful in having the USDA or the FDA arrest Amish farmers simply for doing that, which they've done for the last 200 years in running their farms do you know that how many Amish farmers have gone to jail, been arrested, and constantly harangued by the FDA and USDA simply because they do not pasteurize their milk? Absolutely absurd. If you don't want raw milk, don't buy it. Okay? Yeah. Okay, now we're on the Matt Prince case. We're discussing case, uh, excerpts. It is incontestable that the Constitution established a system of dual sovereignty, although the states surrendered many. Now, that's not true. The states surrendered a few, maybe some, powers to the new federal government. But Scalia made a mistake, but he corrects it in just a minute. They retained, the states retained a residuary and inviolable sovereignty. Do you think if the states were really sovereign, inviolably sovereign, that we would be able to run maybe, oh, and I know Texas is okay on this, but Arizona and Nevada aren't, that we would be able to run our own land? <laughs> now, Texas is only about 2% owned by the federal government. Arizona is like 60, 70, and Nevada is 90. And do you think that we could run maybe our own parks? 
I know I'm going to go out on a limb here. I know we're just a bunch of country bumpkins in Arizona, but I guarantee you we're smart enough to run the Grand Canyon. I guarantee you. And we can run our own education without the federal government. I know that's a stretch, but I'm going to still go there. Okay? Residual state sovereignty. Now, Scalia is taking us through here, you guys. As General Washington said, it's a science. If you do this and this and this, you're going to get this result. So Scalia actually supports this totally. He takes us through this equation for liberty. Remember, you have all of this in this little booklet. Or you can look up the case on the internet. Uh, Cornell University does the best review of it. So Congress did not get all governmental powers. Okay, what's the question there? Well, what kind of powers did they get? Only discrete enumerated ones. So they're very few, they're limited, they're numbered. You could go check right in the Constitution how many they were given. The total is maybe about 40, 40. What are the five law enforcement authorities granted to the federal government in the Constitution? There's five. Treason. <laughs> guys, if the FBI would investigate treason, those poor guys would never get out of uh, Washington, D.C., would they? My goodness. Treason. Counterfeiting. Felonies committed on the high seas. Uh, protect our borders. Yes, that's a law enforcement responsibility. And five, laws against nations or treaties. So if somebody goes into Mexico, we have a treaty, and they violate that treaty. That's an FBI investigation. You can only ask yourself this question. How many have they usurped or stolen since then? It's staggering. Okay. And, then, and then Scalia says, how do we make sure that this is rendered or expressed? Or in other words, it's absolute. How do we make sure that it stays absolute? By the assertion of the Tenth Amendment. And I ask you, who's supposed to enforce the Tenth Amendment? Is there a bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. to do that for us? It's the states to enforce state sovereignty. Wouldn't you think that that would be happening in Texas, the state sovereignty state? The great innovation of this design is that our citizens would have two political capacities, one state and one federal. Get this. Here it is, the subversion of Sheriff Mack and the CSPOA, and we're merely quoting Scalia and his decision, each protected from incursion by the other. So when JFK sent troops into Alabama, great. He was protecting the citizens from the incursion of their state governor and others in the state. Great. We're all for it. We detest that we lived under segregation because of the Supreme Court for 55 years. Sheriffs, we should have stepped up way before then and stopped that, way before then. As Madison expressed it, this is right out of the Federalist Papers. Scalia quoted the Federalist Papers several times. The local or municipal authorities form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy. Get this next one. I didn't make this up. No more subject within their respective sphere of authority to the general authority or federal government than the general authority is subject to them within its own sphere. So does that sound like they're our boss or that we both have and share dual sovereignty? Okay, now Scalia takes us back to this scientific equation that's been talked about today. The separation of the two spheres is one of the, get this folks, ready? Is one of the Constitution's structural protections of liberty. Ah, we don't care about that structural stuff, do we? Structural protection of liberty that we must maintain that relationship between the federal government and federalism. Just as the separation and the independence of the coordinate branches of the federal government serve to prevent the accumulation of excessive power in any one branch, 
a healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government will reduce the risk of tyranny and abuse from either front. Wow. When you came to this seminar today, did you want to know how to reduce tyranny and abuse? There you go. And it's a relationship that must be maintained, and it will take some real work to get it there. Nevertheless, it is our duty. Here we go again, quoting the Federalist Papers. Hence, a double security arises to the rights of the people. Dun, dun, dun. The different governments will control each other. My dear friends, it is our job to control the other governments that are outside the Constitution. Just like Martin Luther King said, we should not be obeying unjust laws. For God's sakes, my dear friends, we should not be enforcing them either. We should be standing against all injustice, and that does not mean we wait for the courts to decide. I'll enforce anything that the legislatures tell me to do until a judge tells me not to. How many times have I heard that? You will enforce tyranny until a judge tells you not to? How about you make your own decision and live to keep the Constitution intact? Liberty is first. Liberty is first, not judges' orders or some mandate from a governor. Liberty is why we're here. It's the basis of the Declaration of Independence, that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's why we're all here, that to secure these rights, we are all established. Okay? Now, this is the threat of arrest. No, 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 sorry. I already showed you that. This is kind of a summary that Scalia makes about the Brady Bill. The power of the federal government would be augmented immeasurably if it were able to impress into its service and at no cost to itself, the police officers of the 50 states. In other words, sheriffs and you people, just so you know, the federal government can't come in here and do that to us. Can we go along willingly? Yes, many of us do. You shouldn't be. I would be very careful with those federal grants. Very careful. Read the fine print because it pretty much tells you what you have to do in order to get that money. And if you don't, they'll pull it. Sheriff Gil Gilbertson in Josephine County, Oregon, lost 66% of, of his budget because they stopped federal funding. He laid off 60% of his deputies. Really sad story. The federal government, we held, may not compel the states to enact or administer a federal regulatory program. I maintain that the state can't do that either to the counties. We must remain independent. This is my favorite quote from the decision that Justice Scalia wrote. I told you about this earlier. This is actually a quote from an, a prior judge. But the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. Did you catch that? How much of the coronavirus mandates would be going through if we uh, abided by this Supreme Court decision? This is a Supreme Court decision. How many care that this already came out, that your good intentions cannot violate the Constitution? And you know that he goes even further? Get this. It, the Constitution, divides power among sovereigns and among branches of government precisely, exactly and precisely, so that we may resist the temptation, resist the temptation, my friends, to concentrate power in one location as an expedient solution to the crisis of the day. If we allow it for this, the crises of the day are going to keep coming and coming and coming because we all got on our hands and knees with the pads and the hand pads and we got on our knees and we succumbed to government. We succumbed to tyranny. And we went along because we trust the... Folks, do your own study and investigation on all the contradictions 
that came out from Fauci and CDC and all these others and who, and we're going along with that? Oh my gosh. And again, I'm not here to discuss the efficacy of any of those laws. I'm here to discuss the principles of liberty that we all promise to uphold and defend. Have we lost our way? Can any of us look at this and tell when we've gone too far? And can any of us look and say, maybe we ought to push back a little bit? Maybe we ought to make masks optional and let people make their own health choices? Let people make their own health choices? Let them? They already have that. In a free country, my dear friends, we would decide for ourselves what to wear on our face and if we put a seatbelt on. I'm sorry. I, uh, I actually told my deputies not to write tickets for people not wearing a seatbelt. Oh, we stopped them. We talked to them. What did we do? Reason and persuade. That's what we did on those stops. And if they didn't have a child in a restraint device, we showed them and told them where they could get one for free or very cheap. And we helped families. We didn't gouge them. And we didn't cite them in. Okay, this is the decision of the court. And I really want you to pay attention to one of these. The federal government may neither, okay, that one's pretty powerful. We've already gone over that quite a bit. But this one is from, just, uh, from Judge John Roll in my first case, where I was on the stand and, he, and the attorney for the federal government was cross-examining me and I thought she was doing a great job. I, I felt like she was putting me in a corner where I couldn't get out. And she said, oh, by the way, what time is it? Yeah. Okay, I'm hurrying, Michael, because I want you to get up here. Okay, all right. So, it it, this, this was amazing. It matters not whether policymaking is involved and no case by case. That happened in my case because the attorney for the federal government started testifying while she's cross-examining me. She turned to the judge and said, well, Your Honor, in the force First four months of the implementation of Brady Bill background checks, we've denied 250,000 felons from getting access to guns. 250,000 felon sheriffs? Really? Were denied access to guns in a gun shop by an FFL? That means that little yellow form they filled out that 250,000 felons said, I'm a fugitive from justice, please come and arrest me. That's what that would have been. Do you know how many were actually arrested during that time? Four. Do you think they lied just a little bit? Ah, it's just the federal government. It's okay. All right. But my judge told the attorney, counselor, do not try to pretend in this courtroom that your statistical analysis equates to constitutionality. Amen. Ha. Yeah. So this is why Justice Scalia put that part in here. No case-by-case -case weighing of the burdens or benefits is necessary. It doesn't matter if they can say the curve was lowered because we socially distanced or we wore masks. That does not make it constitutional, okay? Persuade and convince and teach and reason with, yes, government, do it. But in the final analysis, in America, we choose for ourselves, okay? And such commands are fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system of dual sovereignty. That's the quote from Judge Roll that I just said, okay? And here's the Supreme Court in 7-0 that said, one hopes that this great principle is essential to free society that we don't use hysteria to base our, our laws on. And he, uh, we mistakenly put COVID-10, but he said, essential to any free society, including ours, will not itself become yet another casualty of COVID-19. A casualty, the judges, 7-0 in Michigan, 7-0, said they did not want liberty to be another casualty of the COVID-19. All right, we're gonna keep moving here.
have those front seats. Y'all better make it light on yourselves and let me have those seats. I'm going to take five more minutes, and I want to get Michael Peruk up here, but can I come down? Yeah. Okay. Okay, now, yeah. <laughs> you guys, um, how should this have gone down? Two officers get on the bus and arrest Rosa Parks. I've actually heard that some people have been arrested for not wearing a mask because they were told to leave stores and they didn't and they were arrested for trespass. This was kind of the same as Rosa Parks. She wasn't arrested for not giving her seat to a white man. What was she arrested for? Disorderly conduct. And I maintain she shouldn't have been arrested at all and that a good sheriff and deputy got on there and escort her home safely. You put the law and the tradition and stupid thoughts of segregation in the trash and you uphold and defend the principles of liberty and especially what? The notion that all men are created equal. See, we actually at the CSPOA, we actually believe that. And we believe government should believe it. And we believe in, in that this should all be a peaceful process no matter what we're doing with the COVID-19 process. But no, 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 no. We're going to beat people into submission and we're going to force them to jail. Well, it's okay because a lot of the jails have been emptied of all those child molesters and murderers and drug traffickers so we can make room for all you non-maskers. Gosh, crazy. Okay, I'm here and you're here. Okay. Now, you guys, this isn't going to be easy. This is Larvita and she's from Minnesota and she's a modern day Rosa Parks. And in my estimation, kind of looks like her. Okay, if she had those glasses on, especially. Now, she and her four daughters, you might notice that she's dark complected and God bless her for it, but she's standing for liberty for her and her family. And you know what she's doing? She's refused to enforce mask mandates in her business and she refuses to shut down and the state of Minnesota is going after her, threatening to arrest her, and charging her $1,000 a day. Who should be stopping that, sheriffs? And usually it just takes a phone call. And I'm not kidding you. So, here we go. <laughs> she gets a little emotional with this stuff. <laughs> Now, we're going to do this. We're going to play this out, and then we're going to get Michael Peruk up here. We're going to play this out. And I know this is really hard for her, and it's really hard for me. So I'm going to try to get through this. <laughs> so the sheriff was in the dispatch when that 911 call came from the bus driver. December 1st, 1955, Montgomery, Alabama. I was three weeks away from being three years old when that happened. It happened in my lifetime. I know I don't look that old, thank you. But <laughs> now, the sheriff and Deputy Jones get on the bus and walk up to Rosa Parks and they said, and the sheriff didn't really know what he was doing. But he looked down in her face and he saw her beautiful eyes and he said, 
what seems to be the problem here, ma'am? And she looked up at him and said, why can't we just be left alone? And that got to the sheriff. And he sat down next to her and reached over and he shook her hand and he said, Mrs. Parks, and I've told you this before, what you did here today took a lot of courage and we really appreciate what you did. And it would be an honor for me and my deputy to escort you home safely. Would that be all right? <laughs> and so the good sheriff gets off with her, with his deputy, and they see an all-white restaurant, hamburger place. And the sheriff turns to her and says, well, would you like to go in there and get some hamburgers for you and your family? And she goes, yeah, let's do. You think that place was full at 7 o'clock? It sure was with a bunch of white people. And the sheriff now is teaching the community what we do with stupid laws. And he got her a bunch of hamburgers. And the sheriff decided to pay for them. And he gave them to her for her family because she's getting home late. And then they go outside and on the way home they see an all-white water fountain. And he says, Rosa, you might as well make it three for three. Have a drink. And she did. Gladly. And they got home. And her husband sees the two officers walking home with his wife. And he comes busting out the door and says, what's the matter? And the sheriff goes, it's okay, Mr. Parks. But Rosa refused to give her seat to a white man. And he gets mad at her. I told you not to do that, Rosa. You're causing trouble where we don't need it. You know what could happen to us now? And the good sheriff admonishes him and says, it's okay, Mr. Parks. We got it covered. And we're going to give you extra patrol, aren't we, sheriffs? All night long and throughout the coming days. But Mr. Parks, we can't be here 24 seven. We'll do our best to be really close. But if some hooded guys come and try to do something to you and your family because of this, do you have a gun in the home? And he goes, yes, I sure do, a 12 gauge. And the good sheriff says, is it loaded? And the good Mr. Park says, it doesn't do you any good if it isn't, it is. And so they left, and we should have never heard of Rosa Parks, but we should have heard of the good sheriff and deputy that did the right thing and protected her. And Larvita, you know how much I love you and appreciate what you've done. Thank you so much. And folks, just so you know, when we study, when we study these things out and see what happened during the Revolutionary War and the faith and courage of one George Washington, and we learn so much from him, and we know where we should go today, it's up to us to restore liberty today. And we will never have to fire a single shot. And what I just showed you with Rosa Parks, on our modern day Rosa Parks, you know there's a bunch of them? How about Shelley Luther from the Dallas area? There's one. There's another one. Yep. There's thousands of them all over the country. We should be protecting them. And I so wish we could do more for Larvita and, and others. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down now. Thank you. You've been a great audience. I love you. We're going to finish uh, with Michael Peruka and then go to lunch. Thank you so much for being here.